you to stand as you are able and join with me in our call to worship and opening prayer. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In our prayer of confession, let us now take a moment to pray in silence to confess to the Lord all that is on our heart this day. Let us pray. Let us pray together. Almighty and most merciful God, you know the thoughts of our hearts. We confess that we have sinned against you and done evil in your sight. 
We have transgressed your holy laws. We have disregarded your word and sacraments. Forgive us, O Lord. Give us grace and power to put away all hurtful things, that being delivered from the bondage of sin, we may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance, and from henceforth may ever walk in your holy ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friend, may, friends, may we hear these words of assurance of pardon found in Psalm 103. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Gracious and all-powerful God, we come before you in prayer, not in our own name or power, but in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us proclaim your goodness and mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we have watched the gathering of athletes from around the world at the Paris Olympics, we pray for the many quiet and unseen efforts to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people from every tribe and nation. Give success to those efforts of sharing the good news. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of all the nations of the world that there might be peace in our world so that the gospel can go forth unhindered. Keep our nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Comfort all who mourn the loss of loved ones this day. Bind up the brokenhearted. Enfold those grieving in your embrace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Divine healer, touch the sick, the infirmed, and the injured. Heal bodies, quiet, anxious minds, and allay fears. Give wisdom for those making important decisions about care. We thank you for the medical community dedicated to do good and not harm in bringing relief to those suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, send rain to contain and stop the spread of the fire in California. Bless the efforts of all who are working to stop this fire. Thank you for their dedication and sacrifice. Comfort those who have lost homes and the family of the firefighter pilot who died. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Father, with the saints around your throne, unite our voices in praise of your majesty and glory. Reveal to us the light of your eternal glory that we might live to praise and glorify your holy name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, when we baptize infants and children in our church, we as a congregation make a commitment. We take a vow to do all we can to assist the parents in the nurture uh, and admonition of these children in the Christian faith. We seek to fulfill that with ministries like our Vacation Bible School, our Sunday School program, our Children's Church, and this time set aside in our service for a children's message. And so I'd like to invite all our children down front at this time, and as they are coming, I invite the congregation, as you are able, please stand and greet one another and share the peace of Christ.
we go. As you're being seated, we're going to have a little the children. Good morning, church. Good morning, children. I recognize all of you as three of them are, Vermont, are mine, and I claim Miriam. She's, she's really sweetheart, too. Did you have fun at Bible school? I think that's where everybody's at. They're taking a little break off of this. There was a bunch of kids in, uh, in Sunday school this morning, so that's all right. All right, we're going to do a little lesson this morning. See, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Have you ever heard somebody come and ask mommy or daddy, hey, how are the kids doing? And we respond with, they're growing like weeds. You ever heard us say that? How many, how many of you guys have out there have ever said that? Probably about every, every hand in the, in the bunch. Why, why, why do we say that? It's because weeds grow really, really fast. Really fast. And you guys, like a blink in my eyes, have grown from tiny to how you are now. But how does, how does it happen? You know, you know that at one, some point you're going to stop growing when you get to be 18 or so. Okay? But do you know what keeps growing after you hit adulthood? What do you think? Your heart? Well, your heart stays the same, so let's hope it doesn't get too big. But we can always have a spiritually big heart, right? How about your hair? Your hair is going to constantly grow, yes, because I cut your hair all the time. Your fingernails, your feet, hopefully your feet stop at some point. I had big feet until I got to be about 18. I grew into them finally. What, your nose? No, not your nose. But your muscles will grow if you train them, and your faith will also grow. If you study the Word and you learn about Jesus and you come to church and you be involved with things, your spiritual faith will grow. And your mental faith grows as you go to school and you, and you uh, read the books and you learn about reading, writing, and arithmetic and all this stuff. You, your mental uh, strength and your mind will grow and expand. But there's one more piece that will always grow. And do you guys know what? There's another, another thing in, in your life that's always going to grow. And that is the body of Christ, which is all these people out here that love Jesus, they have joy in the Lord, and as you guys get older and you learn more and more about Jesus and you, as you guys grow more and more, the body of Christ will also grow. So that's kind of a fourth uh, piece to your, your growth in your life. Okay? So let's praise God and thank you every day that we are going to constantly grow, even when we get to adulthood, to be strong, smart, and most importantly, uh, filled with the love of Jesus. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we love you so much. We just thank you for these children. We're, none of us are perfect, but... You love us anyways, and your grace just abounds in our lives. Lord, I ask that you guide us and direct us all the days of our lives. Give us strength, give us hope, and give us the, the tools and resources to raise these children in your way. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, friends, for worshiping with us today at Wesley. We are so delighted by your presence, and we know that it is God that calls us together for worship on each Lord's Day. If you're visiting with us this morning, just please know that we're exceptionally delighted by your presence. And if you're visiting with us this morning, know that there's um, some visitor bags back in the narthex as you exit, and there's free gifts and information in those visitor bags for you. I hope that you'll pick one of those up as you exit after the service. I hope that everyone will take a few moments to find those friendship folders at the end of your pew and fill those out, passing those along. We use the information that you give to us on those attendance sheets in so many different ways. We want to cultivate relationships here at Weston Memorial Church, and the information that you give to us on those attendance sheets helps us to do that. I call your attention to all the announcements in the bulletin, wonderful things going on. Pay attention to camp meeting month. I'm going to go shopping this week for an Hawaiian shirt. Uh, I don't own one, but people are telling me about Dillard's. They're telling me about Goodwill, but I'll find me a cheap Hawaiian shirt. But remember, remember camp meeting month coming up. We want you to be comfortable during the month of August. Also take notice 
of an amazing weekend we'll celebrate August 17th and 18th. That's where our new hymnals, our new Bibles will show up in the pews and that'll have a little impact on some of our worship liturgies and we'll also be opening our um, expanded and renovated Wesson Moore Museum historical room but you read about that in your bulletin. I hope you, you think about Keeping that weekend free, we'll have something on Saturday and something on Sunday, August 17th and 18th. Also, uh, remember the men's group, Wesley 100, they're, they're taking orders for their delicious chicken pies. Uh, the money that's raised through that does amazing mission work through the work of our men's group. Uh, you can still place orders. You can do that in the narthex as you exit this morning. You can call or stop by the church office or see any member of our men's group, and they'll place the order for you, and they'll be available for pickup next week. So uh, thank you for participating in that ministry. You also see an announcement in your bulletin uh, about Wesley Memorial going to Ireland for a pilgrimage. It's a study tour of Ireland next year. We will uh, visit the wonderful country of Ireland, but we'll also be studying the, the roots of English Christianity that in many ways come from Ireland. There's an informational meeting uh, late this afternoon about that. But I hope you read all these announcements. A lot of wonderful things going on in the life of our church family. Now I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Ken to come and tell us some other ways we're changing the world. Let me share with you an exciting event that's going to take place August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. How many of you know the music of Ray Charles? Wonderful. It's not him. <laughs> but it's somebody like him by the name of Charles Ray, who is an area musician, and this is a tribute to his wonderful body of work. There will be lots of artists at six different venues, all of them providing food. And now here's the best part. The profits from this three-day celebration will go to one of our deep level mission partners, West End Ministries. You know some of their ministries, Leslie's House for Homeless Women, their big thrift store, their community gardens, their diligent and expansive work with under-resourced senior adults in that community. So it's a wonderful way to have some fun for you and your spouse if you're married, your plus one, your kids, and it will benefit one of our deep level partners. So thank you in advance. The second thing is I've been struggling a bit trying to find the words to describe what took place last week on this campus as 130 boys and girls came and were nurtured, instructed, loved, and cared for by some 50 adults, middle high and senior high youth for Vacation Bible School. It was an extraordinarily intensive and intentional effort to help these boys and girls learn more about what it means when we say Jesus loves you and what it means for us to follow Jesus as we grow and become adults. It was a wonderful time of holy ministry. And as a part of that, because we're a giving and a growing and a serving community, the boys and girls and Jeff's adult Bible school class were involved in a fundraiser for clean water in the Honduras. And a total of, let's see, what was it? A total of... Uh, $2,400, $2,400 was raised, and that means 480 children will have clean water for a full year. Now, that's just one way to break it down. Clean water is more than just about refreshment and hydration. Clean water, free of parasites, helps children to be healthy that otherwise would miss school, whose lives would be severely limited and even threatened by those impurities of the water. What a good thing. But friends, you make that possible. You make it possible because of your generosity of serving, giving, and growing. Our campus is a ministry tool. Your generosity keeps this campus available to both our congregation and to the community. You make it possible for us to resource the teachers 
and the caregivers of these boys and girls. You made it possible for the resources to be purchased that were used as the study materials for all of them to have. Because we are Wesley in Christ, a serving, growing, giving community of faith. As the ushers come forward, let us worship and make offering with gratitude to God. Amen.
In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we present these gifts into the service of the gospel and the life it brings. Amen. As you're being seated, I invite you to take your Bible, if you will, and go to the Old Testament, and again this week, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Last week and this week, we're looking at this amazing chapter in the Old Testament and learning some important truths about King David and what God has done for you and for me through King David. So we're looking at chapter 7. Last week, um, we looked at the beginning of chapter 7 through the end of verse 11. Last week, perhaps you remember that David was led in his heart to try to do something for God. And it became a great disappointment for David. So we looked at disappointment last week. This week, as we finish out chapter 7, we're going to look at the promise. The promise that's given to David and to us. So with your Bible open before you, I invite you to join me in prayer. God, we're so grateful that you've gathered us together this morning. We experience you through one another we experience you in this act of sacred worship and we especially experience you through your word so God we pray that all earthly distractions will fade away give us hearts to receive what you have for us today give us ears to hear what you're saying to us today and give us grace-filled courage to live as the people of Jesus Christ in this world. In his name we pray. Amen. So last week, the first 11 verses of chapter 7, we saw that David, after he was given rest from all of his surrounding enemies, that was a gift from God, and after he had his home, his house, built a glorious palace there in the city of David, Jerusalem. It was built with cedars of Lebanon. King Hiram of Phoenicia helped him build his glorious palace. And I can just imagine that David one evening was looking out of his glorious palace and he remembered that the Ark of the Covenant, that object that signified the presence of God with the people, was still residing in a tent 
just like it had from the time it was built during the wilderness wanderings of the Israelites as they left Egypt. It was still yet residing in that tent. So David, during this time of peace that God had given him, decided it wasn't right for him to be in this amazing home and God's Ark of the Covenant to still be in a tent. So he decided, he decided that he wanted to build a temple for the Ark of the Covenant to house the presence of God there in the midst of the people. And his prophet Nathan told him to do everything that's in his heart, told that to David. But then that night, God showed up and had a chat with Nathan and told Nathan to tell David that God did not want David to build that temple. And it was pretty clear in in what God relayed to David that David was to be a military leader, a man of blood. He was to be a military leader. He was to continue making the lives of the people secure there in Jerusalem. So he was called to do what God called him to do. He was called to be a military leader, not a temple builder. And I know that was a great disappointment to King David, but last week we saw how at the very end of what God was relaying to David, there comes a promise. There comes an amazing promise. It's a great play on words. God says to David through Nathan, you will not build me a house, but I will build you a house. Now, of course, we know from the text here in the story that the house that God was speaking of was a dynasty was the line of the house of David. Just like you have the house of Windsor in England today, it was a dynasty. So God sent word to David saying, I will not allow you to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. So with that, look at how the text continues, beginning at verse 12. When your days, David, are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. Now, immediately, this is going to eventually be King Solomon, his physical offspring. So God is talking about immediate prophecy and future prophecy. I will raise up your offspring after you, David, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Speaking of Solomon, he shall build a house for my name. Notice it is Solomon who builds the temple. It's Solomon's temple. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. And here comes our word for the day forever. Notice how often this word occurs in the text. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 14, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son and if you're having a hard time following the prophecy here let me just point out to you what I just read that verse that passage occurs in the New Testament book of Hebrews and is a reference to Jesus Christ I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son when he commits iniquity watch this when he commits iniquity I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. Now, speaking of iniquity, that wouldn't be Jesus Christ. So maybe this is speaking immediately of the kings that would come from David, like Solomon and and the line of the king of David, the earthly physical kings. But perhaps for your consideration, I will mention to you that that can be translated instead of when he commits iniquity, You can translate it, when the guilt is laid on him, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. So it still could be a reference to Jesus Christ, the one who was wounded for our transgressions, who was bruised for our iniquity. Upon him, our stripes were laid. So that could still be Jesus. Verse verse 15, but my steadfast love will not apart from him you see the unconditional nature of the covenant with David God makes a covenant here in this chapter with David it's an unconditional covenant which means it is eternal regardless 
of what happens on the human side. So he makes this unconditional covenant. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, David, as I took it from Saul. Remember Saul, the predecessor of David, whom I put away from you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure, and here's our word again, forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision. Nathan spoke to David. Now watch David's response to learning about the gift of the house that God will build for him, David. Verse 18, then King David went in and sat before the Lord. So he went to that tent where the Ark of the Covenant was. He sat before the Ark of the Covenant, sat before the Lord and said, notice David's prayer. I'll just read it. That's what, that's what finishes out the chapter. Notice David's, David's prayer. It's the book of Psalms. It's the prayers in the Bible that teach us how to pray. It's the book of Psalms, mostly written by David. It's the book of Psalms, the prayers in the Bible that give us language for prayer. That's where we go to to enter our school for prayer. So pay attention to David's prayer. He's before the Lord and he begins to pray. Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have, also, you have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is the instruction for mankind, O oh God. Notice David's humility. This is King David. He had his moments when he wasn't greatly humble. But right here before God, seated before God praying, as he reflects on the gift of an ongoing line or dynasty, you see his, you see his humility. Who am I, O oh Lord God? You see his humility, he continues to pray, verse 20. And what more can David say to you, God? For you know your servant, O Lord God. That was both a comfort to David, I'm sure. It was also rather frightening to David, as it is for you and me. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And I hope that's a comfort. God knows us better than we know ourselves. But the one who knows us best loves us most. And that's what David is saying here. He knows that God knows more about David than David knows about David. But he's reflecting in light of God's love. For you know your servant, O Lord God, because of your promise. There's another one of our words for the morning. Because of your promise and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Verse 22, and this is a good verse to memorize so that we can pray it occasionally to God. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God beside you. The prayer continues, according to all that we have heard with our ears, and who is like your people, Israel? Notice the turn. He's been talking about David up to this point. Now he begins in his prayer to talk about the people of David. He begins to talk about the chosen people of God, the people that are inhabiting Jerusalem and the environs around Jerusalem. And who is like your people, Israel? The one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, a nation and its God. And you established for yourself your people Israel to be your people and there's our word again forever when we think about the people of God the chosen the people of Israel we need to remember what God has said about his people and even though God has created them he freed them he's blessed them he's used them to bless the human race for some reason the human race seeks to keep trying to destroy the people of Israel my heart was devastated this week when I saw about the bombing on a soccer field there in the north of Israel where children and teenagers were killed. I have visited there several times in the Golan Heights. The Druze people are wonderful people. They are unique people. They are a blend. They're, 
they're a blend and a rather mysterious secretive almost religion, a blend of Islam and Judaism. But one of the things most unique about the Druze people there is that they are fervent supporters of Israel. They are citizens of the state of Israel. They serve in the Israeli military. And that's one of the reasons they were targeted there in the north of Israel by Hezbollah. The world seeks to destroy the people that God has declared blessed. The people that God has said that I will be your God forever and ever. I will establish you forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. The prayer continues. And now, O Lord God, confirm forever the word that you have spoken concerning your servant, concerning his house, and do as you have spoken, and your name will be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and the house, the dynasty, the lineage of your servant David will be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. David, you won't build me a house, but I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised the good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed forever. I hope when you think about the promises of God and how important the promises of God are to you, you remember this promise from God, the promises that are related in this text. God cannot lie. God is faithful. He cannot be anything other than faithful. So when God promises us something, as we Americans say, you can take that to the bank. You know, I love American English idioms because when you stop to think about it, they don't make a lot of sense. And I love to know what the derivation of that idiom is. You can take it to the bank. I, you know, if I was speaking to somebody who was learning English as a second langu language and I told them to take this to the bank, I'm not sure they would understand what I was saying. You know where that phrase, we know what it means. You can depend upon it. You can stake your life on it. You know it is truthful. You can take it to the bank. You know where that comes from? I get curious about these things. I hope you're curious. I get curious about these things. So I researched where that strange idiom comes from. 1970s television show, Beretta. Isn't it amazing how easily influenced we are? Anyway, the promises of God, you can take them to the bank. You can depend upon them. I am told, never counted, I'm told there's over 7,000 promises in the Word of God. Some people say over 8,000 promises. And these promises will keep us secure. These promises will grant us peace. But we've got to, to know these promises. When you're sailing into the storm, it's a hard time to start learning the promises then. So before you sail into the storm... Before you hit the tragedies of life, or at least the next tragedy, learn the promises of God and know that God cannot lie. God can do nothing but be faithful. And if he has promised it, you can take it to the bank. I hope that right now you're sensing the eyes of Jesus Christ on you. As Jesus says things like, I will be with you forever. I will protect you forever and I'll get you home before the dark. I will be your strength if you let me. I will provide for you. I will give you peace if you let me. I will always love you. I hope that if you're getting wearied by life, getting wearied by circumstances, getting wearied by, by the daily news, that you can hear Jesus saying to you, I have prepared a place for you prepared place and if I have prepared a place for you I will come again and receive you to myself and I hope that you hear the one seated on the throne saying behold 
I make all things new. I hope that you hear the one seated on the throne, the lab upon the throne, saying to you this morning, the kingdoms, plural, the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God and his Christ. That day is coming. There's so many wonderful promises, but I hope that you remind yourself that perhaps the greatest of all promises is the promise that through David, through the line of David, will come the Messiah, will come our Christ, will come our Deliverer, and through him someone will be seated on the throne of David forever. He'll be ruling forever. If you just look at the physical, biological descendants of David, there's no one on the throne today. So you could say God lied, but God cannot lie. So the descendant of David that's ruling today and will rule forever, his name is Jesus. He is ruling. Don't ever let the world confuse you as to who is ruling today. The Bible kept prophesying that Jesus would be this one who would come to, to rule. Genesis 3.15, that's the first proclamation of the gospel. Go look it up sometime. It's where, it's where God says to the woman, says to the serpent, after the serpent had uh, tempted the woman, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, but, but you'll just bruise his heel. So in that first proclamation of the gospel, Genesis 3.15, we learn that the one to come will be human, will be an offspring of woman. Genesis 49.10, when Jacob is blessing the tribes of Israel, when he blesses his son Judah, he says the scepter, that belongs to a king, the scepter will never leave your tribe. And of course, Judah and Benj Benjamin were part of the, the kingdom of Judah. And that's David's tribe. And of course, Micah 5 2. We usually read these kind of texts at Christmas. Micah 5 2 says that this one to come who will rule forever, this one to come will be born in the city of David in Bethlehem. So that's why at Christmas we, we read that hymn that Isaac Watts wrote. It's a paraphrase of Psalm 98. He Christianizes Psalm 98 in an amazing way, and we love to sing that hymn. Joy to the world the Lord is come. I hope you've noticed over all of your Christmases, it's not joy to the world the Lord has come. It's joy to the world the Lord is come. He has come. He is coming. He is with us. He will be with us forever. He is ruling today. And he will rule for all eternity. And we're the people on planet earth wise enough to receive his kingship. And to bend our knee and bow our heart before him. Amen. Friends, as we respond to this word, let us come together and face the cross and let us affirm what we believe using the Apostles' Creed found in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you.
hope you enjoyed a little Christmas in July. But this serves as a reminder that for us, Christmas is not a date on a calendar. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of viewing the world around us. And it's a way of life. So now, friends, go forth into the world to show the world what a life looks like that has bent the knee before King Jesus and has bowed the heart before King Jesus. And may the blessing of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with you always.